get going and show you, try to dispel, dispel a few myths and show you some dangers of using tomography. Prices of cameras have come down. This was $15,000 not a few years ago. It's probably eight now. Uh, the floor that you guys have, they're probably down around the four or $5,000 range now. So just a few years ago, you could buy 12. a camera for less than $20,000. That camera was $12,000 a year and a half ago. Yeah, and now you can buy it for $2,500. So, technology has really driven the price down. So everybody's buying these things. So as you can imagine, the people who are really wanting these things, the contractors, want to go out and get work. So they'll take a camera, they can go out to their house, they can get the pictures for you, and show you where the hot air is coming out, where the cold air is going in, and they sell you a job. Part of my purpose here today is not only to give you a background on thermal images and how they work and give you a little practical experience, but to point out some of the dangers and pitfalls of using these things, how they're used dishonestly an awful lot, and how you can be misled very, very easily. Let's take, for example, let me turn this on. The presentation itself probably has 30 or 40 slides. We may or may not cover them all. But the things I really want to drive home to you is interpreting the results and the fact that you can make a thermal imaging camera do anything you want. You can make hot look cold and cold look hot. If you're trying to sell an air conditioning job, you want everything to look hot. If you're trying to sell a heat job, you want everything to look cold. And you can do that with a camera. So a lot of operating a camera is on our Netflix. Same thing with any modeling software you're going to use for doing an audit. You can make that audit come out any way you want. It's up to you to be honest and ethical about doing it. I can tell you from first-hand experience that if you're ethical and you have a high level of honor when you're doing these things, it won't take long to be recognized for that. Your credibility will be way up and you won't have any problems selling jobs or convincing people what you want to know. You lie one time, you're all done. So let's take an example. Wes's door over there. This camera right here actually has picture in picture, so we can see the visible light around it. We can see the infrared inside. And let's see, I have uh, that door over there looks almost room temperature. You don't really see a whole lot of difference, right? But if I really wanted that to show up, take this. I'm going to drop the upper. Notice I had settings of 25 degrees to 95 degrees. I'm going to really drop this down to just above room temperature. And I'm going to bring the other one up to just below room temperature. The uh, floor camera is a little quicker to get these numbers up than this one. A lot. Now if you go look at that door, you can see that little white right there. And you look at the what looks like some kind of loss coming out over here. White is hot compared to the rest of it. You start to see some heat come out over here. You focus on that a little better. When you focus an infrared camera, you're only focusing the infrared portion. It does not focus the visible light portion. That's a fixed focal length. There's no adjusting that. So as we tighten it, so before you couldn't see any difference around that door whatsoever. Now it looks like, well, there's, there's some heat coming out of that door. I come over here and tighten this up a little bit more.
but you have some threshold. This one's five degrees. So to change it, I really need to get this one up. So as I raise the temperature on this, you'll start to see the door again. It's going to appear hot. And then it's going to start appearing cold. Let me get down below and change the other one. What's happened here is I raised the upper temperature so much that everything in the room looks cold compared to the high end. And that door looks cold or hot now. Same door. It's the operation of the camera that makes it look different. Everything about infrared cameras is relevant to the relationship. Forget about temperature. I'll explain more why you don't want to worry about the temperature. You want to worry about the relativity. I've got this thing set up now for 75 to 90. It's probably 73 in a room. Everything in a room is going to look cold compared to 75. Because everything in a room is cold. It's certainly going to look cold at 90. If I lower it to below ambient, it's going to look hot. So what do you want the camera to do? How do you want it to look? It's entirely up to you what you do with this camera. So this is one of the biggest dangers with cameras is interpreting the results and how people are presenting it. If somebody gives you a, a picture of something and it doesn't have a scale on the right hand side, it's worthless. Everything has to have a reference. What does blue mean? If you look on the right, it means, well, it's somewhere around 75 degrees. If it was red, it'd be somewhere around 90. You have a scale of this. It's rough for this scale. But you can shut that off. Without that, it would be a okay? The other thing you have, well, back up a little bit on the cameras, there's two modes on the camera. What I just showed you is a manual mode. I adjusted the there are two ways to adjust it. They can adjust the range, which is the top to bottom, from 90 to 70 or 80 to 60. I can start adjusting the width of that and get better resolution and better detail. Or I can shift the entire scale down and up. So you have both. You need to use both to get a good picture. That's the manual mode. That's the only way to really use an infrared camera. The lazy way that most beginners <coughs> use is automatic. This one doesn't have an automatic mode, it's a high-end camera. But if I were to take an automatic camera, what it would do, it would come into the room, point it at something, it would look at the maximum temperature in that square image, it would look at the minimum temperature, it would set the maximum up top, the minimum at the bottom, and the middle would be whatever it is. So it takes a generalization of what it's looking at. Okay? That's how it does it on automatic. Now I'm pointing at that door, Wes's room is a little warmer than the rest of this room. So as I point the automatic camera at that, it's going to give me a certain setting. It's going to say, well, I want to be somewhere between 82 and 62 because that room is warm. If I start canning the room, it's going to start changing that scale because now it's not looking at 82. It's looking at a max of 75. So it starts to change its power. So it does this change of going from this to this as you sweep the room. So let's say you have a window over there that you want to measure, and you want to compare it to a window over here, and you can't fit them in the same frame. You have to pan. If you have it in automatic, the color palette is going to change completely based on all the temperatures that are in there. You can't do a direct comparison of that window to that window. And if we had the, we'll show you later on with the blur because it will do automatic. As you pan the room, the color palette changes completely and you really can't do a good comparison of one window to the other. You put it in a man manual mode, and no matter where you go, it's going to retain those settings, and you get nice, consistent results. So if you see someone using a camera, and they're in the automatic mode, they haven't even begun to use that camera properly. They're being very lazy about the way they do things. It's a great way to start, because you don't have to sit here and say, well, what's the ambient in the room? What's the maximum temperature? It's a good way to start. But you really want to take it right off of automatic, throw it in manual, start to do some adjustments. So that said, let's just show you a picture here and see if I can get your ideas of what this picture can be. Let's see, here it is. I gotta change this. Anybody tell me what that is? A pretty clear picture. It, it does three or four things for me. First off, it's all infrared, right? So you don't have a visual reference of visible light. You can't really see. 
see what is that. Unlike before, you had a surrounding of the wall, and you could actually see the door, just the door with an IR. You had something to reference. And you could look at that picture and say, that's Wes's office. You're looking at this, clearly it's a heat source, but what is it? Well, you might be able to figure out with the coils here, it must be a, a burner of some type, right? So it's a little electric burner. Well, what's this stuff? We'll get to that in a minute. This collar over here, if you look at the scale, says it's about 126 degrees. And then over here, it says it's about 300 degrees. So I've got this variation in temperature along this object. And it's sitting right on top of this burner. What in the world could you put on top of an electric burner and you would have a variation in temperature all along the length of about a foot? I'll show it to you and then I'll explain it. This is the visible light picture. This is a piece of two pieces of copper pipe sitting right on top of a burner. You'll notice the top part of it is black and the rest of it is bright copper. Would you even think that the temperature of this copper tubing is going to be cooler here than it is here, sitting on top of this burner element? Would anybody disagree that the temperature should be the same along the entire copper pipe, sitting on top of the heating element? Thoughts? Idea? How many think that the pipe should all be the same temperature? How many think it should be a different temperature? Is the other burner on or just the, that it's one? It's on. It's red. It's, it's no, no, on. the burner below that you can it's only on. see. It's on. Both burners are on. Yeah. That, oh. that whole burner is on. That one's on too. But let's just focus on this piece. You get two pieces of copper pipe. Should this one be hotter than this one? Yes or no question. Should not be, right? Okay. Go back to the picture. Come on. My mouth. Here's two pieces of pipe. This one's down in the 130 degree range, this one's up in a 369 degree range. Same pipe. Anybody have an explanation? I hope not. That's my big surprise. Yeah, let me go back to the picture. Infrared cameras do not look at visible light. They don't see the things that your eyes see. They see the things that your eyes don't see. They're below the visible spectrum. They see things you don't see. And it's counterintuitive, and I'll get more, especially when we start talking about glass, as to what they're actually doing. The reason I show you this photograph is to show you that what the camera sees isn't necessarily true. It's trying to tell you that the bottom part of the pipe is hotter than the top part of the pipe. Cameras, infrared cameras see, see three things. They see heat that is, let me hold up a piece of something here. Can I hold this? They would see light that is directly reflected, or heat or light that's directly, directly reflected off of here. So if I have a heat source here, and this is a high shiny object, like a mirror, invisible light, you'd see yourself, right? If I had a flat black object, like this, could you see yourself in it? No. So this one is reflective, this one is not, right? Same thing with visible, with the infrared technology. You have those two components. You have some reflected light, and you have some non-reflective light. It depends what you're looking at. In this case, you're looking at a mirror or you're looking at a piece of flat. In the infrared world, it isn't that straightforward. For example, a mirror. A mirror may not be as reflective as a piece of flat black metal, flat black. In the infrared technology, it's different. So you have three components. You have the reflection. You have the heat holding on to this thing, getting it warm. It has nothing to do with what it's looking at. It has everything to do with I'm warming it up. It's been in this room and it's at a certain temperature. It doesn't matter if I point it at the window, if I point it at you, if I point it at the furnace, it's a certain temperature, right? So you could grab this thing. If you took an infrared image of this thing right now and it said it was minus 20 degrees, would you believe it? If it said it was 190 degrees, would you believe it? I'm holding on to it. I'll tell you. Okay? But a highly reflective surface, and I'll show you that, can tell you exactly that. It's full you dramatic. This is what this is doing. The copper tubing right here, you'll notice is bright and shiny. You notice here it's flat black. That attacks, there are three pieces to test the thermal imaging cameras. Reflectivity, which is what I mentioned a minute ago, you've seen things back at you. Emissivity, which is the temperature of the object, pushing off 
heat. It's hot, it wants to migrate to cold, that's emissivity. The other one is transmissivity. For example, if you're looking through a window, visible light, you can see through the window, can't you? It doesn't reflect back at you, you see through it. In a thermal world, you have the same property. Transmissivity comes through it. Emissivity is its actual temperature. The reflectivity is whatever's bouncing off it. And the camera sees all three. It's up to you to decide which one is the predominant, which one's correct. Black has an emissivity of one, which is perfect, quite natural. Flat black is an emissivity of one, which means it's perfect. It doesn't reflect anything. It doesn't transmit anything. It gives its actual temperature. So if you're taking a temperature right here, that is very, very close to the actual temperature of that problem. If you take a temperature reading here, it's telling you taking the temperature of the copper plus whatever is reflecting off of it and puts those together and the net result is your temperature. So we get back to the question, why does it appear to be so much cooler on the bright shiny part? You have to understand the context of this. This is a burner that's sitting on a flat soft surface in a driveway outdoors. As a burner, it has two pieces of pipe on it, and they're getting hot. Simple as that. When I look at the flat black, I'm actually getting no reflection whatsoever, no transmissivity. It is a temperature pipe. When I look at the shiny part of the copper tubing, and I'm looking straight down, where is it reflected? Straight up, just like a mirror. It's bright and shiny. So I'm pointing down, any light coming or heat coming down from it is going to point right back at the camera. It's going to reflect that it's bright and shiny. It's pointing at the sky. If I take this camera and point it, not at the sun, because there's a big dome over the camera, you just draw a camera and point at the sun. The sun's over there, and I point it straight up at the sky. And it's uh, 104 degrees outside today. Is it going to see heat? Or is it going to see cold? Or is it going to see 104? What's it going to see? If somebody give me some number, what's it going to see? 100. 100. What else? Any other guesses? All of them. Good, good, good answer. Anybody else? I'm not saying anyone's right yet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get, uh, Why? You didn't have to scale. You're, you're probably that. pretty close to the answer there. If you were to get in, a, in an airplane and go straight up 50,000 feet, you would get hotter or colder. Why? It's out of space, right? This camera is looking straight up. There is nothing between it and outer space. It's looking straight up. Now tell me again what it's going to see. Wicked is 40. Okay. Minus 40. Wicked cold. I don't like to talk temperatures, and you'll find out as I go why I don't discuss temperatures, but wicked cold, okay? So this is 350 degrees in the black, probably pretty close to the actual temperature. This said 125 degrees. It is taking the reflection from outer space off the bright, shiny object, bringing it back to the camera, taking the actual temperature to copper tubing, bringing it back to the camera, and it's doing some math. And it's telling me it's not that hot. I wouldn't touch it. So here's a case that demonstrates very well the top part of the pipe is black. It's giving almost perfect emissivity. There are no other com com components to that. That's pretty close to the temperature. The shiny part, anybody's guess. It depends on what portion of the atmosphere is taking or the reflection, what portion of that is taking what portion of the actual temperature, taking all that into effect. No guarantees, that's just an absolute wasted garbage that means nothing. So if somebody would tell you that was 126 degrees, and you'd say, well, that's not so bad, I can touch it. You'd be in trouble. The reflective component is there. I bet no one in this room looked at this picture and thought that they were actually getting a cold component on this part of the pipe because it's pointing in the sky. Let me give you another example. Uh, Wes, could I get you to stand in front of your door? Yeah, I'm going to change this thing here. <coughs> now, what's the, body, what's the average body temperature? 98.6. Let me see if I can lower the threshold just a little bit. Come on. I'm going to lower this to something normal. 
98.6, right? Let's just bring this up to about 99. We'll get a good picture. Okay. That's probably pretty good. Yeah, we'll focus in a little bit. You can see his face is hotter than his beard, it's hotter than his suspenders, his hands are hotter than his shirt. Not a bad image, okay? If you step on the other side of the door and see if we can see it through the black. I can see him in the camera scene. Where do you go? So this cam, this glass, as opposed to the visible light, this glass has no transmissivity at all. Nothing comes through it that the camera can see. Otherwise, we'd see the 98 degrees. Nothing's coming through that glass. The transmissivity of that glass is zip. So the only two components of that glass are reflectivity and the actual temperature of glass. Could I get you just to move to the side a little bit? I'm looking straight on that glass. It all appears to be uniform right now. 79.6, thereabouts, is about the temperature of that glass, okay? About, I could be off a couple of degrees. The cameras do not take precise measurements on anything except flat glass. That can, that glass has some reflectivity to it, which I'll show you in a minute. So let's say the glass was 80 and something cold was on this side, it would influence it. If something hot was on this side, it would influence it. Now let me show you, if I can get you to very slowly move this way, across the glass first, go right across the glass, keep going. Up, a little bit more, keep going, and come this way. I want you to stand like right at the corner of that table. Keep it right at the corner of this table right here. Keep going. Oh, yeah, right about there. Now, what's going on right here? Shadow, reflection. Reflectivity. Does glass reflect? You can see through it. It doesn't bounce back at you in a visible light scenario, but it does here. All of a sudden, the temperature of that glass is up to 81 degrees. We just said a minute ago, the glass is 76 degrees. He's influencing what you're seeing on that glass. So, reflectivity, emissivity, and transmissivity. What's coming through, what's being reflected, reflected, and what's the actual temperature of that? Three components. And what I want to try to impress upon you is you have to control those three components. And oftentimes, you can't. If you're taking a picture of something shiny on the ground and pulling up in the sky, how do you correct that? If you are taking a picture of a motor that's inside of an enclosure, how do you take a picture of it? It's silver and it's broken. How do you control that? What they'll often do in industrial applications is they'll paint whatever they can flat black. At least, for example, if they have a pipe. They, oh, they want to predict the maintenance. They want to know what's the temperature of that pipe over months. They'll paint a black stripe on it for two purposes. Number one, they eliminated reflectivity and transmissivity. It's all in the city. You know what the temperature is. And they're measuring the exact same spot every single time. So they'll actually flat black paint things to, that they want to measure all the time. Another trick is uh, electrical tape. Electrical tape has a 0.98, close enough to one. You put point, a little piece of tape Okay, we can try that uh, coffee pot right there. Notice the entire coffee pot looks the same until we shut this off. Coffee pot looks all the same temperature, right? One big blob. I come over here and I raise this stuff. And I'm on the lower bottom. I tighten down my camera. I'll get a much better picture of it. I just want to see the coffee pot and nothing else because it's so much hotter than anything around it. I want to get rid of white. I want to get more into a usable spectrum. How hot do you think that coffee pot is? West? Yeah? In the Somewhere 125, than, 130? Less than 212, right? I think so. I don't see any steam. We'll see if the camera will work that high. And then we'll see if we can distinguish the handle from the glass, from the black.
Do you know what, what is the temperature that people feel uncomfortable where they feel burned by? Well, McDonald's does now. Start to see the bottom of the pot is very hot. The top is very cold, so I'm going to adjust the bottom. Very cold being 163. Yeah. Compared to the bottom, everything's relevant. You're going to start to see the pot coming out. Now, the top's blue. Isn't that blue, blue represent cold? If you showed the average person a picture, thermal imaging picture without a scale, they'd say blue is cold. In this case, blue, 154 degrees. So you can make pot cold. And then a little more, we'll see the whole pot. That's pretty good. Right there. Actually, see the handle coming out. So now we've got this spot right there at 179 degrees. It's white because it's, our top end is 175, so it's too hot for that. I should have brought it up a little more. But you can see the gradients are to cut now 171, 166. The top is, of course, cooler as we go up, 141. So you can actually start to see that. If we point it, a laser pointer on here somewhere. The black tape right there, you can just about see it. If I open this up a little more, you'll be able to. See the black tape on there right here? It looks to be about the same temperature, which is telling me 
There's not a lot of reflectivity here, or there's nothing influencing this picture. something cold and I put it over here on the side. There you go. You see how the pot is hot, but all of you on the left here is starting to look cold. It hasn't changed temperature at all. There we go. It hasn't changed temperature as you can see the cup. The glass over here on the left, right over here, hasn't changed temperature but it's reflecting the temperature of that cup that was ice. So it has a reflective point. A long way of repeating the same thing because I can't say it enough. When you take images with a thermal imager, you have to know the properties of what you're looking at. So if you're trying to measure the performance of glass on a building, you have to know it's going to reflect whatever's on the side of it. It's not going to see what's on the other side of it. Okay? Now we'll listen to this. We'll know what we're talking about. We got a pretty good image of the coffee shop. Now we want to get down here. Our range is 150, 135 to 175. Certainly the ice is uh, cold than that, right? So if we lower this thing, it's going to take So we learned what reflectivity was. We know that it's a very big component we have to look out for all the time. We're going to get into a couple of pictures to show you some homes, which is what the primary concern is here. Come on. And then we're going to get into a little presentation about the camera itself. We'll take a break probably 20 minutes from now, a half hour, let's go out and use cameras. So when you see a picture, like take an infrared camera, like an IC or something, the window is red hot. There's a good chance that it will just set right most of that is reflecting from, say, the sun. If it was taken on a really hot day outside, you're seeing the reflective heat. If, the, if it's 20 degrees, you take it a day like today, and the inside of the house is 70 degrees, and they have cheap windows, they kind of look hot. It could actually be the temperature of glass, could be a reflection from the sun. You just don't know. You have to know the conditions under which that was taken. So it's better, I mean, you can take a picture, say, to a picture on a cloudy day, it's one of the best time to take it. Right? Evenings, evenings, if you're going to do infrared work properly, you're going to be out a lot of nights. So nighttime. You want the sun. There, as you see as we go through, there are so many things you can do with a camera right after the sun goes down that you can't do when the sun's up. You also take images from that, that house from the inside and the out. You want to do it on both sides. The blower door is a great way to do that. You put the blower door on, it actually forces air into or out of the building, and you can get better pictures. But if you're wondering, if you look at that window, for example, it's hot from the outside, what's it look like from the inside? If it's cold from the inside, hot from the outside, it's got to be reflected somewhere. It should be the same temperature. You always do it from both sides. Come on. We get a well-rounded picture of that glass right there and be able to see exactly how full into that glass is. When I took my class at Fleur, the, the National Geographic had just come out fairly recently with a, um, an IR image on the front cover. Yeah. And the guy was saying how that was just totally misinterpreted in the magazine. And then even in a magazine like that, you know? Yes. All depends what the author's trying to show. I reset the camera so I don't have to screw around with the settings. I wanted to auto sense what's in that glass. That's a better place of starting than to try to sit here all day and adjust those settings. While you're doing that, shall I show them on our camera how it's done? Sure. Although this is going to take just as long to boot up as. Yeah, yeah I'm this almost done. This will take time. See if that has a video output, we can look around for the projector if you want. Here we go, good. Got a nice automatic setting here. It's got to focus on that glass. As soon as that thing goes, every time you, you uh, reset this camera, you're going to go ahead and tell it to open up the video report.
here we have a nice image of glass. So you can see where the ice is, where the uh, ice is not against the glass. If I turn the glass, you should be able to see the ice is against this part more than one on the other part. You can get a pretty decent image of that picture right there. If you remove the coffee pot, you notice the setting of 25 to 99. If you were to take this out of the picture, take the heat away from this thing, and this is putting out a lot of heat. It's going to give you a better, the next time I reset that camera, it's going to take a look at what's in this cup. This one's full of ice. This one's yeah. full of hot water. And the tripod's not strong enough for it, obviously. It's going to take a look. See what a projector's red over there right inside? That's where it's getting its 99 degrees. It's getting its lower end from the ice that's right in the middle. Wes, could you just move that cup up to the other end of the table? Yeah. Now, as you come over here, if you were to reset that camera, you wouldn't get the 99 at the top. You would take a, a big temperature reading in the area and give you a better rest of the camera. You could probably do that when you work better. It just does not have an automatic setting. Does it have a video out? Yes. You can go right up here. See the spot where the, the spot where the coffee pot was? It's still there. Okay, now you notice it's got 90 degrees, 76 to 37. It sensed everything around it, room temperature, down to what it thought was a polis. Now if I move it up to scale. Now if you move it up to where it is, it includes this hot spot and changes the scale. You don't get the resolution that you can if you zoom. Get it clo real close to that glass, nothing else but the glass. Move right in on it. And you'll see that it really changes the scale when you get far better definition. Okay, you'll have to back up a little bit. You have right about a little more down the top of the you, you get a lot better definition the closer you get. This is where these things are designed to work. Within 14 feet, you can get real good resolution to the point. Can you see what's going on? Oh. Well, you should be able to see where my finger can come. In fact, one of the, when I first got these cameras, I could follow my cat around the house because I could see the cat. To do that, you need to get that camera down to about 10 degrees span. See, otherwise you just won't see it. So, let's raise, while he's doing that, let me ask you a question. You're going to do a thermal imaging on a house. And let's say this is New Hampshire, and we're not doing a lot of air conditioning, it's all heat. And we want to know what the heat loss is on home by using a thermal camera. You have to do most of your work in the summer or winter. The camera away from April to October. Not going to be any good at all. The house is going to be want to be around 68 degrees, and it's going to be at least 68 outside. Rule of thumb, you need 20 degrees difference outside to in to get an effective analysis. If you get really good and you get a good camera, you can do it at 10, especially with a blow it But it's hard. You really want to shoot for that 20 degrees. You want to do it when the sun's not on the house because that's active solar heating and you're not looking for that. You want to take a look at heat loss from outside the house. You don't want the sun beating down on it. This is too many factors. You want to do it first thing in the morning before the sun comes up when the house has had time to stay watch. You're going to do it after the sun goes down. You better wait two hours. The outside of the house comes down to temperature. 
but you really want to be doing this stuff, and your sun's not out, you don't want to lose a 20 degree difference. However, if you have an air-conditioned house, and it's 100 degrees outside, you can do this. You just have to factor in where the sun is, try to get the shady, if the sun rises from the south, right, it hits the south side, try to get the north side of the house, get a good basis for it. Factor in the sun, you can do this. Okay, so, excuse me. So on automatic, we've got a low here of 35 and a high of 75. So, so, that, so I want, I'm set, saying the middle is around 55, so we want 50 to 60 on here? Well, if you depend, do you want to look at just this portion and see if there's anything, any irregularities in here, or do you want to look at the ice and see some real good detail in there? If you want to look at this and it says it's 35 degrees, you might want to set your camera 30 to 40, and then you'll be able to see more gradients in here, more evolution. Is it necessary? No, I know they license that glass, it's cold. If you're looking at a house and you have hot air coming out from around a, a window, or cold air coming in from around the window, you don't need to know more than that. You don't need to know whether it's 30 degrees or 20 degrees. It's cold. It's coming in. It shouldn't be there. That's all you need to know. But you need to be able to at least know in your own mind that it's real, and it's not some game you can't play on. Okay, let's, uh, I have some other pictures here that we can start getting into. Now, I, excuse me for interrupting you here, but, yeah. okay, wait a second, so what is So I've shut your camera off but no, the question is when I move the when I move this up. Yeah. Let me just leave it right there, but at least I, I want them to see this. Okay? The bottom, both of them are moving up at the same time. Well, I'll explain that in a minute. But let me show them what you got as it's interesting. He changed the scale. Now the now the glass is hot instead of cold. It's no longer blue. It's hot. It's the same temperature. It hasn't changed. But it looks hot. Right. It happened that way. I wanted to show it to you. But what was your question? Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, on this to camera it. here, it's called level and span. Span is the range of temperature. Level is where it is on the temperature scale. So let's say this is 55, this is 45, this is 65. If you want to keep the 20 degree difference, you can level it down so now the middle of the 35 and it's still 20 degrees. Or you can leave it at 55 and narrow it. To narrow it, you go left, right. You go left, right, it changes the width. So hit the left side, you notice this is now 34, 90 degrees difference. Push it to the right, the span is going to change. Gotcha. It's going to get but bigger. now I can move that span up or down yeah. with like the same relevant, relative, yeah. rather. Correct. Right. Now you're about to put everything out except the ice. That's all you can see is the ice. The reason this is important is if you really, if everything there, this really comes into play when you're trying to get a four or five degree difference on something. Uh, for example, it's 68 in the house and it's 58 outside. The customer really wants an infrared picture. This is where you have to get really good at narrowing that thing down to three or four degrees, really looking around the edges of the window to see what's going on. Any fool can do it with a 50 degree difference. Yeah, yeah, pretty good with a camera strap. So let's get into this. Camera that you have with any camera. 
You have to have focus. Everything has to be in focus. You saw as we were focusing these things in, they get crystallized. You can see the, the ice line as opposed to something blurry. Brightness. You have to be bright enough to see it. If it's dark, you can't see anything. Contrast. You guys can all have copied this presentation. I've sent it to the rest already, so you don't necessarily have to wait for the time you don't want. That's the contrast. Uh, perspective. I can see from this picture that this is at the beach. There's water back there, there's sand in the front. They took this picture at the beach. There's perspective there. When I was taking a picture of his door, if I zoomed in just on the glass, you wouldn't know if it was a door or a glass. By backing off and getting perspective, you know it's both. So often you will take a picture from here and then you will move right in and get the detail that you want and associate the two together. And composition. Same thing to do with a visible light camera. You need all of those things with infrared, otherwise you're meaningless. If you're going to give a $500 out to somebody and it says door needs replacing and all he can see is the doorknob, not going to be very credible. He's going to want to know that that door was in his house. He needs some reference there. Thermal span and thermal level, thermal range, there's a number of different words for where it is in the spectrum and how narrow it is. We use level and span when we deal with these cameras. Floor might be range and gain. They use different names, but they're all the same thing. You can narrow it, and you can shift it up and down. Okay? This is a pretty good picture because it has all of the things I was talking about, for the most part. I know from being in the utility that this is the top of a reflower. This is one of these is in, one of them's out, doesn't really matter. But one of them is considerably hotter than the other. If I had just this, it wouldn't mean anything. Is that normal? Maybe that's normal. By looking at both of them, I know that that can't be normal. This one's not hot at all. And on these devices, what goes in comes out. So I know this is hot, this isn't, it's probably a problem there. If I'm familiar with it, they told me that this was taken at a certain substation. I can see in the background some of the stuff that's going on, and I can get some idea where this was, and I can compare the temperature of one and the temperature of the other. Now let's get into temperature. You notice there's no temperature on this picture, for good reason. If you, when you take pictures with a camera, it's kind of like taking it with a thermometer. Every thermometer is going to be a little different. Only it's a little more complicated because you can adjust this camera. You can't adjust the thermometer. You can be completely off with this thing. Remember I told you there's reflectivity, emissivity, and transmissivity? You can adjust all three of those things on this camera. You can tell it that something has a property that it doesn't. So the temperature is rather unimportant because of that. Secondly, knowing that it can be off at least 10%, if I took a picture of that and sent it to one of my engineers and said, that's running at... Uh, 214 degrees. And I know it can be 10 to 10% 10 off, but 214 degrees. You gotta take a calculator out and say, well, it's okay, it's good to 260. Not, and not just my engineers, engineers in anybody in a technical field. They're gonna pull out their guide and they're gonna see what the outside range of that is. You told me 214, there's nothing wrong with that. It might be 230. You can't get that good with these cameras on standard objects without knowing the exact what they are, and even then it's difficult. Stay away from giving exact temperatures. All I'm going to tell you is that is inordinately hot. If you don't fix it, it's going to burn down. Radiometrics is the term used for measuring temperature with a thermal camera. You take thermal images, that's great. You have a relationship. You can see what's hot. You can see what's cold. The minute you start putting this out here, now it's radiometric. I can look at this and look at this and say that it's 25 degrees C. This looks like it's 29.8 degrees C. You have to be sure to get across to these recipients. Those are approximations. They're pretty good. They could be off 10%. Okay? I wasn't standing five feet from this when I took the picture. I'm down the ground with the up. What else can I see? You're already covered now. Yeah, we covered a lot of this stuff already. These things, most of them, did yours have a laser? Yes. Okay. Most of them have a laser. A few things you want to be very careful of. In this room here, when you're playing with these cameras, I don't want any laser to be turned off. Safety. Flash somebody's eyes and dish you burn. It. Very dangerous. You don't want to be doing it. Secondly, you're out in the public. You scan somebody's house with it, they're in a the kitchen or in a living. Say they're in the bathroom doing their hair or whatever, and this red dot comes pointing at it, what do you think they're going to think? Mm -hmm. In today's society. 
kind of scared the hell off. You happen to point it up, airplanes are going over there. They're going to think they're painted. There's a big problem with that right now. People are being arrested for doing exactly that, pointing laser products at aircraft. Blinds the cockpit, that also causes alarm. You have to be extremely careful with these things. You want to be, you know, you're pointing pretty much at something, say, just like a gun, before you turn that laser beam on, okay? This one is set up so you have to actually pull the button. Others, you turn it on, it stays on. And that's where you can end up scanning and putting it on. So be very careful with lasers, and I appreciate it. you wouldn't use them here at all. Uh, this is an electrical picture. I'll skip over it. Uh, this is one of the cam the cameras I'm going to lend you. You have the FLIR and so on. You can use this camera right here. I'm going to kind of jump right through the uh, how this camera works because I'll show you hands on during the playoff exactly how to use the camera. It's not hard. Probably not going to do a lot of manual because we have a big crowd, but we at least have a chance to turn it on, put it in automatic, and find some hot items and define and get some pictures. Okay, we need the lab. Mostly, you know, when you look at a visual camera, when you uh, use a, a visible light camera, everything's in megapixels, right? 5 megapixels, 10 megapixels, not all of them are 1 megapixel. But everything's in megapixel. The higher the megapixel, the better the resolution. It's no different on imaging cameras, except they call them elements 120 by 160 element. If you go to a 240 by 320, you have better resolution. That's all it is. So the higher end cameras, one of the things you pay for, they're all going to see the image. They're all going to see it from about the same distance, but you'll get better resolution of what these are creating. There are usually three palettes on all cameras. Rainbow, iron, and black and white, at the very least. And some cameras have gradients in between. You can look at it in black and white, and you can see the difference here. Black is cold, white is hot. You can look at it in uh, this panel right here with the dyer, and it shows you a little more color. Or you can put it in rainbow, which gives you a rainbow color. Same image, same information, just different palettes. Which one do you use? Okay. Which one would you use? Very good. Which one would you use? Which one would you use? Anybody here use black and white? Yes? No? Yes. Good answer. It depends on what you're trying to do. Black and white you're going to find is by far the easiest to focus. Focusing a thermal camera is very difficult, very challenging. It, you can go by it in a hurry, especially yours because it's electronic. Mine's manual to your control. But you can go by that focus point very, very easily. It's hard to see. In black and white, it's much easier to see. You get a nice, crisp object. My recommendation is you put it in black and white, get your focus, then put it on whatever you want. The ultimate answer to what color you ultimately use, personal choice. That's all it is. The black and white one is easier to focus. Okay, here's a mug we looked at a little while ago. We played with this a little bit. We raised and lowered the scale. We got to see a little more definition on the mug. And that's all they're doing here. They just raise the low and scale to see how they're doing. And it tells you how to freeze an image. We're going to do all that in the camera here. Okay. Here's what I was trying to tell you earlier. The distances at which a camera will see. If you have a, take a one inch object and start back in the way, we did this in one class where they had a projector, what call a black body. It's like a projector with a black lens on it. And it has a perfect emissivity one. And you're supposed to stand on the back away so you can't see it anymore. That tells you what the absolute light you can is. And they're all around 20 feet. Why don't we take five minutes to take a personal break? And we come back, we'll have these cameras up and running. We'll break them up in groups of two. You can grab one, I'll grab the other, and we'll show them how to use the camera. We'll do that.
Can we turn that coffee pot back on and get some hot water? Thank you. 